Before the, I read the scripture reading for this morning, one thing I neglected to mention was that the beautiful flowers on the altar today are a gift from the senior choir in memory of Bill Fee, and I wanted to make sure that that was put out there for you. The scripture reading today is <clears throat> from Matthew 5, 13 to 20. You can find that on page 786 of the Bible in, your, in the pew pocket in front of you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have come not to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This ends the reading. Will you join me in a moment of silent reflection on these words? Amen. Generally speaking, I would imagine that being told that you are the light of the world is a far greater compliment than being told that you are the salt of the earth, at least on the face of it. There are places where being called the salt of the earth is deeply meaningful. I think about the upper Midwest where I served a church as such a place, but I don't think that that designation is so widely valued. We all like light. Light is warm. Light is inviting. Light illuminates. Light shines. Salt? Well, many people like salt. It's tasty. But how do you describe that taste of salt without calling it, well, salty? And I'm not sure it's a great compliment for someone to call you a salty person. There are songs, many songs, written about light. Neil Diamond's Turn On The Heart Light, right? We know that one. Journeys, When The Lights Go Down In The City. Manfred Mann's Blinded By The Light. Racked up like a deuce, another runner in the night. Clearest, clearest picture ever. <laughs> Debbie Boone, you light up my life. You all know that one, right? <clears throat> and more recently, Sean Paul's, just give me the light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just give me the light. I have no idea what it's about. No idea. <laughs> what about songs about salt? Jimmy Buffett does mention salt in Margaritaville. <laughs> Searching for my lost sa shaker of salt, but uh, otherwise you'd be hard pressed to name another one. Unless you're a big fan of the musical Godspell, which actually in includes the song, you are the light of the world, and later, you are the salt of the earth, which is actually about this scripture passage, so that really doesn't count. 
On some level, these two things, light and salt, are very different. And they seem completely incompatible. And yet they are placed one after another in this passage from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew to convey a very similar point. Salt and light, what could they possibly have in common? Now, I'm not much of a cook. I'm not afraid to admit it. It's not something about which I am ashamed. It's just a fact. It could be hereditary. While my brother can grill a nice steak, no other member of my family is particularly talented in the culinary arts. So cooking is just something I never really got excited about or took an interest in pursuing as a hobby. I do enjoy helping out a little bit in the prep, and I'm generally willing to clean up, generally. <laughs> but cooking is just not one of my talents, and so I sought out a more informed perspective. A close friend of mine, his name is Shane, he happens to be a minister in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ tradition, has taken a number of cooking lessons and is quite a good cook. Unlike me, he loves to cook. He shared with me some of the things he's been learning in his cooking classes, and it seemed that every sauce he talked about had one thing in common. Salt. Yeah, yeah, you saw that coming. I asked him about this, wondering aloud whether or not including salt in everything just made everything taste salty. And he immediately corrected me. He passed along something that one of the chefs that taught his classes explained. And if you're a cook yourself, you are familiar with this concept. Salt in cooking, you see, is a seasoning, not a flavor. As such, its purpose is not to add a distinct flavor to the sauce or dish, but rather the purpose of salt is to bring out the other flavors in the recipe. As for light, coincidentally, there is a culinary connection here as well. Again, we go to Shane. One of his teaching chefs, still speaking about salt, called it the flashlight of cooking, explaining that it shines a light on all the other flavors. I tell you, it's almost like Shane was taking a class in cooking entitled, Cooking with Chef Jesus on the Mount. <laughs> like salt that encourages and highlights the flavors of a recipe, light is not the focus itself. Rather, the light draws attention to that which upon it shines. Light has a purpose, a vocation, if you will. It lends definition and confounds the darkness. Marcia Riggs of Columbia Theological Seminary, commenting on this passage, talks about it this way. Salt is used to enhance the taste of foods. Light enables us to see things and is a kind of energy that gives things color and definition. Combining these images, then, Jesus calls us to provide the opportunity for others to fulfill their potential, to create the setting and circumstances where their talents and perspectives might be enhanced, and to live authentic lives, and to be their best selves. Sounds like a wonderful mission and vision for a church, doesn't it? It's a call to vocation for an entire congregation, one that speaks to what we can, what we can and should be for the people who are part of our congregation but also one that speaks to what we can and should be for the wider community in which we live and work. But to fulfill this call, to engage this vision, to become salt and light for those to whom we minister within the church and within the wider community, we must first have a clear sense of who we are as a congregation. Without that sense of clarity, we will lack the necessary focus to shine our light where it is needed. And without that sense of clarity, we will just be a bunch of dampened salt all clumped up in the shaker. What then is the salt that we bring to the table? What is the light that we shine in dark corners? My friends, I look around this congregation as we prepare ourselves for an annual meeting and embark on a new year in the life of this church, and I see a wonderfully diverse collection of people representing different perspectives and views. I see people who have been here at Manhattan Beach Community Church for many years who have come to truly love one another. And I see people who are newer to the congregation, who have experienced a sense of welcome 
and who have found a sense of place. I see people who are sincere in their wish to grow in their faith. And that, my friends, works better when we engage together. I was recently speaking with a clergy colleague of mine, the Reverend Alan Hilton. He described something to me, a concept of church, and one that I had coincidentally been considering since before my arrival here at MBCC, as far back as my initial conversations with the search committee. It's an idea of church that seeks to fulfill God's prayer in the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, that they may all be one. It's an idea of church that embodies the boundless sense of welcome we claim each week when we say that no matter who you are and where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. It's an idea of church that serves to affirm the various perspectives that are present within a congregation and recognizes what each person has to offer to the life of the church. For my friends, we may all live in the same general geographic area, but as we are all well aware, we are not always of the same mind. And that is not something to fear or to deny. It is something to be celebrated and embraced. For the church is not a place to go to escape or pretend that we are all the same. The church can be a place where we can come together and discuss the issues that are affecting our lives, our community, and our world. What we do and say at church can and should be relevant to the rest of our lives. And should we embrace this opportunity to engage one another, we will all be better off for it. My friend Alan described it this way. We move from simply tolerance, past respect, to growing together. From simply tolerating the existence of differing viewpoints, to respecting one another's right to their own views, to engaging one another, sharing in respectful, faithful conversation, and growing together as a result. Perhaps this sounds like a pipe dream. I understand that our culture is not rife with examples where this actually takes place. Washington, D.C.? No. Sacramento? No. Even within our own communities, when there is disagreement, the response is rarely productive conversation and more often shouting matches or complete disengagement. In most civic settings, the three-step process never even achieves tolerance of diverse views. We live in an I'm right, you're wrong culture. If your ideas are different from mine, I don't want to know. And if I do know, I must either convince you that you're wrong or act as if you do not exist. What if we could model something different? What if we could be a place where individuals who disagreed could do so respectfully? What if we could be a place where the discussion respectfully acknowledged the faithfulness of various viewpoints? What if we could be a place where we engage with the hope of learning from one another and growing together? We might be able to authentically say that no matter who you are and where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And further, no matter your perspective, your voice is welcome here. Because all voices are welcome. And no one has the right to shut down or shout down views that are not their own. Because each of us is a valued and beloved child of God and each of us brings a perspective that should be heard. That is salty, my friends. Being a place where the individuals within the community are encouraged to share, encouraged to allow their flavor to truly come out. And that is illuminating as well. Being a place where aspects of who we are are not left in the dark corners, but brought out to be seen in the light. And more than that, it is salt and light for the wider community as we can model what is needed so desperately in the broader culture. As a community of people who care for and about one another, we will engage respectfully and faithfully with the relevant issues of our day, with our hearts, our minds, and our whole selves, spreading salt, showering light throughout the world. This coming fall, the United Church of Christ will embark on a denomination-wide mission effort 
aimed at addressing the issue of illiteracy in our nation. As a congregation, I will encourage us to embrace this opportunity to be in part of this important endeavor. It will be a time for us to put into practice this model of church as we engage one another about the issues surrounding the problem of illiteracy. We will not simply tolerate the divergent opinions related to the cause or potential solutions. We will not stop at simply respecting that our approach to the problem may differ. We will grow together in our conversations and we will grow together as we join in this nationwide effort to make a difference. And we will make a difference. Perhaps we will establish relationships with schools in Manhattan Beach. Or perhaps we will look beyond our borders, reaching outside our bubble to engage students and schools in underperforming settings. Perhaps we might share out of our abundance to bring much needed hope and change to a school that lies in an economically challenged neighborhood. Who knows what will be possible should we embrace a vision of engagement and bring our whole selves, thoughts, feelings, and actions to the table to make a difference. That is salty, my friends. Bringing just the right spice into the life of a child or of a school, allowing the fullness of their potential to be realized. And that is illuminating as well as light is brought into places that have been overlooked, places we might have written off, encouraging a light that has been dimmed for far too long to shine like we never imagined it could. It is good to be salty in a world where flavor needs to be encouraged, just as it is good to be a light in a world where darkness is a constant threat. I look forward to our journey together as we let our salty light shine. Amen. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Go forth from this place and find those places where the flavor is just not quite there and season it to allow the flavor to come out. And go out and find those places lost in the shadows, covered by darkness, and shine your light so that all may shine theirs. Amen.